Again. Hello, everyone. Hey, female sheep. <laughs> Did you not do it? No, I didn't do it. Unbelievable. Uh, no, no. Hello, everybody. Welcome <laughs> to Gorilla Position. Uh, this is a very special episode of Gorilla Position. My name is James Delo, your host and guide through the wonderful world of WWE, and this, your pro wrestling slash sports entertainment podcast of pleasure. The show made for fans by fans. Uh, if you're listening on Talk Sports or iTunes or Stitcher or Audio Boom, hello you. Uh, thanks as ever for downloading, subscribing, streaming. Generally, thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, if you're watching this very special episode on on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Gorilla Position WWE. Hello. Hello, Hello Simon. Hello, you. Hello, you. <laughs> Hello, Simon. Hello, you fat. Never mind. <laughs> don't swear. Don't swear. Yeah. Um, well, this isn't the Stone Cold podcast. I can't swear. No, you can't swear on this one. Yeah. Uh, and a big old hello, hello you to the GP faithful who are joining us. Thank you very much for traveling uh, for, uh, to London today. Very last minute opportunity to do this special live record of GP ahead of WWE's big one-off show tomorrow night just next door of the O2. That is going to be a lot of fun. Have you all got tickets? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Louder, are you excited about tomorrow night? Yeah. yeah. What match are you excited about most? Sammy Zane, Kevin Owens, Sammy Zane. Sammy Zane, Kevin Owens. Big show match. Yeah, always big show. Yeah. Always yeah, a big too show. Late, too late, too late. <laughs> Actually, to be quite honest with you, I'm excited about Sammy Zane and Kevin Owens too. So, anyway. They're going to tear the house yeah, down. Of course uh, they are. Those guys are amazing. It's going to be a lot of fun tomorrow night. You've completely given away who the special guest is on this week's show. I'm go- I've got a big intro for you. So thanks for ruining that. What, my uh, big intro? Yeah. Yeah, but dude, you know how many years I've had to listen to my intro? I mean, like, really? Should we play it? Like, no, do not play <laughs> my <laughs> intro. Do not play my intro. I actually, years ago, I had some work done in my house, had a media room built, and I had a bathroom in the media room, and some idiot friend of mine decided that when I turned on my bathroom light, it would play my theme music. <laughs> <laughs> I literally reached in the ceiling and tore the speaker out of the ceiling. So please don't do that to me. One, it scared me. <laughs> Two, it's very inappropriate to try to go to the restroom with your own theme music playing. It's, <laughs> it's not conducive to having a good bathroom experience. Sounds like a lot of fun to me. Hey, not for me. No, I'd no. love music okay. playing. Well, it's the big show. <laughs> yeah, I, I need more fiber. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, I'm going to uh, shout out to one of my right-hand men. Uh, he's a rapper, he's a DJ, co-host of the Kickout podcast with friend of the show, BBC Radio 1 Extra. You know host, I'm a rapper too, DJ right? Ace. No, I'm a yeah, rapper. Seriously, as well. no, are you kidding me? I call my rap name underground is Saran Rap because I got it covered. Woo! Good. Good. That's really lame. I know Buzz. it was lame. I just thought of it. It's cool. Okay. That was a good one. Yeah, no, it was terrible. No, it was terrible. It's okay. It was, it was meant to be terrible. It's all right. right. Poor joke to start off the show. Uh, Skillet, how are you? Skillet? I'm good. How are you, James? I'm very well, thank you. And how is everybody well. here? Everybody's good. Yeah. All right. And how are you, Big Show? I'm great. This feels like some kind of intervention for group therapy. <laughs> How are we feeling? Tell us where you are, where you're from. What's bothering you today? Is anything bothering you today? No, nah, nothing, brother. I'm nothing. good. I'm cool in the gang. Cool in the gang. You are cool in the gang. Uh, obviously, unfortunately, the other right-hand man, part of the team, the all-important third member of the three-man booth, Ash Rose, is on a family holiday this week. Oh, he was, yeah. Let me guess. He's like, a, he's, he's like a Sami Zayn fan. He didn't want to be here because I'm here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he so, was so, like, so. Big Show. Well, no. Big Show's coming. I'm no. going on holiday. Piss off. No. <laughs> Um, so yes, he is on holiday. He was genuinely very gutted to be missing uh, this special show. But and I think it's fair to say, big, bringing in a replacement for Ash this week, this person would have some fairly sizable shoes to fill. But our guest has got those big feet to fill those shoes. Ladies and gentlemen, please finally give it up for our guest today, the Big, big Show. show. Yeah. Come on, Big Show. Yeah. Play the theme tune. Play the theme tune. No, I, that was so I don't want to get killed. I, just, I figured it out that he wrote his intro, and by God, he was getting his intro out. So <laughs> that was done. I've been sitting there for five minutes. I'm, you're still getting intro. I wrote this. I spent time with it. It's exactly. Exactly. Okay, it was well done. Thank you Great very much. Great presentation. Thank you very much. So far, I like the presentation of the show, the professionalism, Good. the enthusiasm of the crowd participation. And as a guest, I don't feel awkward at all sitting here. Oh, good. Well, I'm pleased. I'm pleased. Being serious. I'm, I'm pleased. being funny. I'm not okay. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about the fans here. These guys have come all the way to see you. Right. Now, our show, Gorilla I'm Position. I'm sure they just came to see you, and this is a Gorilla Position. You know, I, I, really I think, think none I of them came to the hit. draw see here is the Gorilla Position. Yes. Oh, well, thanks. I appreciate that. that. You like our logo? You like our branding? Uh, the the logo is amazing. Yeah, thanks. exactly. It's what I do. I put people over. <laughs> <laughs> 
And you've been doing that for quite a few years now, haven't you? Long time. Yes. <laughs> Long time. Um, now, my, my favorite was one time they were doing my DVD and they were trying to find somebody I'd actually beaten. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. You've never won. No, I know. I, yeah, yeah. Just put something in there. You'll find something. Is it just a single disc release? Uh, half a disc. Have a disc. Good, good. Uh, now talking about Gorilla Position and our brand, this right. is a this is a celebration show of WWE. Oh, you fantastic. know we like to be uh, a little on the lighter side. Yeah, we, we like to be honest and and in our critique right, and our review right. of what's going on on, on WWE TV. But what generally, the heck am I doing here? <laughs> generally, <laughs> it's a it's a big celebration of our love of WWE and the product. Fantastic. We try and put a positive spin on it, everything. Skillet, you've got your microphone ready to go. I was wondering if we could go around the room sure. and talk about the stuff that you guys are enjoying uh, across the board in WWE right now. What is exciting you guys? Any volunteers who want to speak first? Anybody who wants to speak? You want to go first? You what's, go. So who have we got over there, Skills? So what's your name and where are you from? Uh, I'm Chris Rana from Hampshire. From Hampshire, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, what are you enjoying about the WWE right now? Right now, I'm really enjoying the brand split. Because, you know, it used to be Spider-Man was just a repeat of Raw. But by having two separate brands, two separate bosses, we get different matches each every week. Okay. And uh, do you have a, a brand you prefer more? I'm going to say Smackdown. It's more of a, a wrestling show. It's more, more of a... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Big Show. You know the Big Show's on a Raw, right? Yeah, yeah. He is. I'm, actually not, I'm actually not on Raw. I got drafted, but I haven't had to show up for work, so I'm not offended. That's a good <laughs> point. But yeah, it's, I just find it more of a wrestling show. Okay. So... So that's more... Yeah. Okay. Wrestling show. Interesting. Okay, that's I'm an interesting... Curious. I'm curious. You say wrestling show. What do you mean? As in, kind of, on um, Raw, there's more kind of like... More like promos, the more talking, more kind of too much talking. If like, who do you think's talking too much? Roman Reigns. Um. <laughs> Why do you think? No, I'm serious. Okay, now this is a good. No. This is no, this is good because this is something I want to get into. What's the problem with Roman? What's the problem with him? Yeah. Um, I feel like. Not, not so much now, but... No, like, I'm not aggressive. I'm not intimidated. No, no, no. no I'm not going to come across the table and show stuff. It's getting know heated already. I love it. I see, I see a lot of stuff online where I see yeah. that stuff, and I want to know why. Because maybe I'm looking at things from a different perspective. What's your opinion? From, just like from a fan standpoint, we feel like he's been like kind of, you know, shoved down our throats a little bit too much kind of thing. Like, mm -hmm. they're, trying to, like they're trying to make him seem a, like part two, like, you know, the big dog of the company. And the fans, you know, the fans would like who they like, you know, Kevin Owens, like, you know, he'd maybe be a bad guy, but the fans would cheer for him. Right. And I, I speak for myself, I guess. Um, we just feel like even if we don't like him, he's going to be pushed down our throat because someone sees money in him, but the fans don't for now. But that, but that can always change because, you know, opinions can change. I love that I started this with, uh, what are we loving about WWE? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, well, I hate Roman here's Reigns. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I only brought that up. And, and, I, and, I, and I did it out of, for no other reason other than clinical discussion. Let's evaluate what our opinions are. Uh, I think the biggest problem I have sometimes with um, some online comments and stuff about certain talent is there's a few smarks out there, and we all know what smarks are. Well, I don't like this guy. He's getting a company push. He's getting a company push. Okay. Well, let's look at what's around and why this guy is getting this opportunity. What are we trying to do? Um, what's going on with that talent? That talent doesn't say, hey, I want to be, I want to get the company pushed. What it's saying is this guy's, with his attitude, with his in-ring performance, Roman Reigns has done some really amazing things when Roman has the right opponent. And I'm sorry, Roman's getting pushed because of, yes, what he looks like. He is a good-looking dude. He is an athletic dude. Roman's still trying to find out who he is. If you can understand, Roman's only been around, what, two years, three years? It's not like he's, you know what I mean? They're, they're trying to find what works for him. Roman is the type of guy that works good when he has a great opponent, when he has a bigger opponent. How much did you enjoy the Brock Lesnar-Roman stuff? Personally, you personally. You didn't like, you didn't, why? Yeah. Like you just hate Roman because he's good looking or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like Kevin Owens because I'm better looking at Kevin Owens. <laughs> the hell with Roman. Now, yeah, he's now, now me, here's the thing, storyline, I like the Brock Roman stuff because I like the fact that Roman showed a lot of tenacity. Okay, Brock's dangerous. There's not um, Brock's a worker, but there's not one person out there that believes that Brock's not physical in the ring. You need opponents for Brock. I thought Roman did a fantastic job. I thought that did a lot of credit for Roman. Um, I enjoyed the stuff that I did with Roman because I thought Roman sold well for me. Granted, he went above and beyond, tried to give me four Superman punches. The spears were unbelievable. But I think a guy like Roman, don't be so quick to throw him under the bus and say, ah, he's getting shoved down our throats. 
it's getting shoved down your throats. That's at the time for the past couple of years, you know, they were trying to find something that worked for the kid. Don't think of it as being shoved down your throat. Think of it as this is a kid that we see a lot of potential in who has a chance to, to do well for our company. And they're trying to find the right place for him. And he's trying to find himself. You know what I mean? I mean, not everybody can come in and, and have their stuff put together. I mean, how, many, how long did John Cena work dark matches before? Um, I mean, sorry, John Cena. How long did Kurt Angle work dark matches before he ever hit TV? Kurt Angle worked dark matches for over a year at every Raw before he ever hit TV, before you ever saw Kurt Angle. He had the time to invest in that. You know, I mean, I think now with the brand split, um, I do agree with you that it's better for the product. But don't, don't get on that gravy train of hating guys because you feel like they're getting the corporate push. That's, that's some smart somewhere who's talking and really doesn't know what's going on. You see potential in talent, just like you run a sports team. You see a potential in a running back, you see potential in a quarterback, yet you're going to push them. You know, they might go out and throw 14 interceptions in one game. Doesn't mean you give up on the guy in one game because you know that there's something about him that has the potential to do really well. So don't. I mean, you're going to have guys who you like and who you hate anyway. I know, but I just, I, I'd love for you to, to look at it a little bit more positive light because, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys out there that um, um, deserve a little bit more credit for what they're doing than what they get, if I can say that politely. So don't you ever bring your negativity in here. <laughs> no, it's not that, hey, no, no, no. Oh, dang. Don't, 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 don't mistake what I'm saying. Hey, you like who you like. If you don't, hey. A lot of people don't like how I wrestle. I'm cool with it. I'm a giant. I got three moves, maybe two and a half. <laughs> I'm okay with it if you don't like it. But I know I service a role as far as I'm good at certain things. Am I good at a chain wrestling match with Dolph Ziggler? Actually, with Dolph, I probably could do that. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. I'm not going to do my own horn, but Dolph's so good, he can make me look good. But anyway. Uh, who else have we got here, Skillet? What's your name and where are you from? I'm Tess from Blackheath. Blackheath, okay. And I just want to say that with um, the brand split, with the guys coming up from NXT now, you're seeing a lot more variety in the ring. It's mm -hmm. not just the Smash Mouth uh, brawl that you used to have. There's a lot more technical skills in there. Right. There's a lot of guys there uh, in WWE now, like Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, that I would love to see against Kurt Angle. Well, here's the thing. You're not gonna, you probably won't see Kurt Angle back in WWE because he's doing his thing. No, Who I'm knows? No, style. I understand the style, but the, the biggest thing that's that I think is great for us now is, is hopefully um, hopefully these guys will be able to get storylines will help get them invested. That's the biggest difference between finding superstars that you love and guys that you don't know is, is storyline, quality storylines and time invested so that you can become emotionally invested with the characters. You think about all your favorites that you have, they've done something in their career where they made you emotionally invested, whether they had a match that blew your socks off or a promo that blew your socks, whatever it was, they made you emotionally invested. Now with the brand split and the different writers, hopefully there'll be a lot more opportunity for those guys. Because you know, a lot of breakout stars um, really got their break back in the day when we did the brand split, brand split a long time ago. You know, Cena and Brock and Randy and, you know, Edge and Christian, you know, we, we got the, that brand split so things could, could settle a little bit. But I think the smart thing they're doing this time is they're doing completely different writing teams. That's, that's, yeah. that's very key because when you got one guys, and it's, not, it's no disrespect to our writing team, they're trying to do a lot. You know, they're trying to make, you know, the talent happy. They're trying to make you happy. They're trying to make, you know, Vince happy. You know what I mean? That's, I, trust me, that's a... That's a job for losing your hair and getting an ulcer in two weeks for you a writer. Anybody else got any questions? Anyone else? What, what are people enjoying WWE? Me, personally, I'm loving the Cruiserweight Classic. Are we, yes! all, are we all loving that? I love it. It's awesome, yeah. right? It's unbelievable. You uh, know, I part two is I got to see one of my very dear friends on the Cruiserweight Classic. It was Brian Kendrick. Yeah. I'll I tell you what. I saw him out there. I was like, oh, man. Last Wednesday night, his match against... Uh, Kota Ibushi. Kota Ibushi. Ridiculous, Phenomenal right? story. Yeah, look, I got goosebumps. Dude. And Daniel Bryan coming in. I'm just so in mad because they're doing all my moves. I'm not allowed to do it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a giant, but, you know. Loving the Cruiserweight I think in classic. my heart, I'm a Cruiserweight in my heart. No, that's, uh, that's exciting um, competitive stuff. And I'm glad that they gave a chance to, to truly spotlight that and make its own unique show, its own unique feel. And when you're watching it, you feel like you're watching a completely different product. And I think that's very good for you guys and very responsible for us. 
It's yeah. WWE. I'm loving the tournament. Next episode is tomorrow night as we record this on the WWE Network. And then the semifinals and the finals on the 14th of September on the <sighs> WWE Network. Any, any predictions for the winner of the Cruiserweight Classic? Come on, who, who's got a guess? Okay, Big Show, coming to you. Who's Big Show. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's a slight in favor. Love if you run in towards the end. He, yeah, I'm going to run in and just, uh, you know, I've had a few turns in my career. <laughs> <laughs> One or two. Just, just a few. One or two. Just a few, you know. Oh, wait a minute. We need a heel. Um, oh, there's Big Show. Oh, we need a baby face. Oh, there's Big Show. <laughs> I have to ask you, who are you impersonating when you do that voice? Um, <laughs> I think that is just a general um, fictional creative office voice for um, an imaginary character that decides my fate, you know. Um, because it didn't uh, sound like that the person who had that voice. Didn't no, have very no, big no, 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 no. It's 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 just it's the it's the fictional uh, direction with Big Show. Like uh, uh, one night I'm a heel against John Cena, you know, <laughs> and then I get a phone call. Yeah, we need you to go to Seattle and wrestle CM Punk in a cage as a babyface. I said I was just a heel. On, okay, so I'm in Seattle grinning and waving, and you know, Punk was good enough. He was a heel, and it actually worked out. But I was like, who changes? Twice in a week, I do. <laughs> and that'll be, the last, do. that'll be the last. I'm a schizophrenic of... that's had more turns in NASCAR. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That'll be the last mention of CM Punk, obviously. Uh, Skillet, who have we got over there? <laughs> What's your name and where are you from? I'm Dylan. I'm from London. Hey, Dylan, how are you? I'm good, thank you. What's your question? So I love the fact that we're in the reality era and. As of recent, you've kind of been able to tell, you can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not so real. So what's scripted, for example, with The Miz the other day on Talking Smack, you couldn't tell what he crossed the line with or if it was all kind of predetermined. You want to know behind the curtain? Of, and and yeah. the same with Brock Lesnar and Randy Orton. What was real, what was planned? Did Chris Jericho actually get into beef backstage with him? And that's the beauty of it though, right? You know, that's, the, not knowing. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's the magic. When we Here's the thing, everybody's a consummate professional, everybody has families, everybody has tempers, everybody has passion. Uh, Miz actually is one of the guys I respect a lot. Not his in-ring character, like I say all the time, I love Mike, I wanna punch Miz in the mouth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because Miz has that innate ability and that arrogance to, as a heel, to make you hate him within five seconds of him opening his mouth. Mike is a very hardworking, dedicated, you know, great husband, hardworking talent who never says no to anything, and they run Mike to death. They will work him seven days a week, 365, and that kid never complains, he never bitches. You potato him in the ring by accident, never says a word, he's always got a handshake, says thank you. He's a hardworking kid. Now at the same time, it's real easy to find a place to get to if there's some reality based to it get the, you're personally emotionally involved we did the thing with boss man years ago with my dad right best storyline ever <laughs> <laughs> best storyline ever but uh, that was a situation where I sat down with Terry Taylor who was an agent at the time you know, you know Terry was one of the ones that originally trained me he says we need to find a way to make you humanize you to the audience how do we humanize you how do we make people become emotionally invested in you and care about you um, that was my idea I said well you know the only thing I mean you know, I lost my dad a few years ago to cancer, which was cool because at the time I lost my dad, um, I was in school, wasn't prepared for it, da 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 Vince did a whole good thing where he'd rang the bell ten times and we told a good storyline and Ray Trailer, boss man, was amazing to work with the ring and such a good heel. But it gave me a chance to get upset. I know you guys have seen me cry a hundred times. I get it. That's the only problem. You get good at something, you do it a lot around here. But, uh, you know, it, got, it was a great character uh, arc for me because it gave me some place to go. Miz on Talking Smack I loved because he got fired up. I think it was you know it was a situation where whether Miz personally felt the remarks were bad or not I don't know because you know, here's the thing I haven't talked to Mike I have no idea did he get a little bit pissed off? If he did get pissed off good for him he's earned the right to in my opinion. You know what I mean? Uh, did Brock bust open Randy? Yeah, he bust open. Did he do it on purpose? Who knows? Is it a work? Who knows? I mean, oh, did Brock get pissed off at Randy shooting off his mouth? It happens. Here's the thing. Do you like everybody you work with? Do you like everybody you go to school with? 
You got people you have to be around you don't like. Sometimes it happens. Is I saying there's heat between those two guys? No, I don't think so. I don't know. Is Jericho the type that would get in Brock's face? Absolutely. <laughs> Jer Jericho was one of my favorite tag team partners because we were like an old married couple. I mean, we lived in Tampa. We lived four houses apart. And on the road, when we were tagging together, they had the card printed on the wall. And I was asking, so who are we wrestling tonight? He says, I don't know, put your freaking glasses on. So we're like, an, I'd have to put my glasses on to read the card before I had LASIK. So we're like an old married couple. But Jericho's never been afraid. Uh, he's had that tenacity to go up against anybody. He'd fight me, Brock, you know, anybody. Um, which shows how a guy Jericho's size, who, knock on wood, never been injured, you know, goes out every night, 110% every night. He doesn't do anything but give the crowd 110% every night, and he's managed to stay injury free. So if you got to think about it, Jericho is probably one of the toughest guys in our business ever. Probably next to Bob Backlund, though. I think Backlund probably, <laughs> Backlund's probably the scariest, toughest guy ever. Like, yeah, I, I would not want to see Backlund back in his heyday. He just, he's like half crazy and really in shape. That would be a bad combo. Yeah, that's a heady mix. Yeah, uh, yeah. You mentioned traveling just now. I want to talk to you about traveling. The, the schedule, we all know the WWE schedule is ridiculous. You're on the road all the time. Traveling the world more now yeah. so than ever, I, w I would imagine. I think there's a lot of outlets for our product now. Yeah, a lot yeah. of brands. NXT and the Raw and the SmackDown brand, yeah. And you are such a huge attraction. Sure, so I say I got a big ass? Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> that was my roundabout way of saying Roundabout right saying? Um, You've got a big ass, Big Show. It's like huge. Like, do you beep when you back up? Yeah. It's a very good Indian impression. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so your your travel schedule, you even even when you're not on TV, I imagine you're doing a lot of the, the live events. Well, you try to stay busy, yeah. 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 So how is the travel for a man of your stature? Um, I'm not, I'm, How does Big Show travel the world? Well, I, my schedule actually has lightened up in the past six months, the lightest it's ever been. Um, literally, for me, they've really given me a, a good break. Like, I was used to working, I was going out Fridays and coming home Wednesdays. Um, for 20-something years, I did that five days a week. I would do Raws and Smackdowns and sometimes have... Uh, much to your guys' dismay, I'd be on two or three segments every show. <laughs> ah, I got to turn the channel, big show's on. Hey, I'm playing a role. I can't help it. I don't want to work three segments either, but I got to. But anyway, um, my schedule's lighting up a lot. But even flying over here like today, like I flew in today from Miami, um, somebody has figured out on planes that if they make really cool contoured styling with smaller seats, they can get more seats in and charge more money. Uh, my shoulders are getting too wide for the seats now. It's, uh, it's like, yeah, can I turn sideways like this? They have these nice little pods that regular people look so comfortable in. They're like little cradle babies in bassinets, and I, I look like a gorilla in a coffee cup. So, <laughs> um, but, you know, you don't accept that. I've had to catch the small planes and, and, and deal with the travel because it, there's no reason to bitch about traveling. I mean, pardon my language, but I swear it happens. Don't. You can't complain about traveling. You have two choices. Either you go to work and accept it, or you don't. You're not going to be able to fly jets and limousines and, and all that fancy stuff all the time, which I hate limos anyway because they're the most awkward thing in the world to get in and out of anyway. <laughs> so. But uh, um, you just have to accept it and deal with it. You know, um, Anything that you do that you love doing, you'll make sacrifices to do that. Um, you know, so for me, a lot of the guys, you know, I'll sit in a plane, the overhead compartment's right here, and if we hit any turbulence, I'm getting my neck broken instantly. <laughs> and I say, man, how do you do? I said, well, I have a choice. I can either go to work or not. I choose to go to work. So the rest of it's just as it is. You take it as it comes. People bugging you in the airport, you know, you're excited for people to see you. Well, sometimes you haven't slept in 40 hours and you're dragging through the airport, you know, and you really just want to get to the bathroom because you couldn't fit in the bathroom on a plane and your back teeth are floating because you got to pee so bad and, you know, five people want to take individual pictures. Sometimes it's a little hard to be nice, but I still man, I haven't peed myself yet, so. <laughs> Close a couple of times. Close. It's like, no, I really got to pee. Just one more, Big Show. I really got to, okay, I got to pee. So, anyway. You learn to accept it. I mean, you can bitch and complain about a lot of things in life, but you know what? Um, 
be thankful for the opportunities you're getting, the opportunity to do something you love, and uh, um, you don't have to bitch about anything. And so, do you do you still love this? You've been in WWE for I do. 19 years I, now. I, How are those passion levels for you? Passion level is 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 still a hard time. Believe me, if I could do three segments on every TV show and drive you guys insane, I wouldn't heartbeat. <laughs> Um, I love being out there and I love performing. Um, I love being in the locker room with the guys. I love the camaraderie. I love the, I love walking through that curtain and looking at the other guys going, yeah, beat that. You know what I mean? Top that. You know what I mean? Um, which wasn't a big deal when I did it because it wasn't that hard. But anyway, <laughs> I still said it with enthusiasm. No, but I mean, you know, you love that. That and now, especially with the brand split, because this is an exciting time as a talent too, because. Man, you, there's opportunity here, and it's knocking. And man, whatever angle you get, I mean, take it. I mean, I wasn't doing anything. The last brand split, the first one that I was a part of, I had done the WrestleMania stuff. Jr. Had sent me to Louisville for a year to to heal up an injury and, and lose weight and whatever other BS was going on. And then I came back. I wasn't doing much. WWE wasn't high on me at all. And, but I, the year I spent in Louisville, I got to know Brock, Randy, and Cena. And then they came up. And then Brock was a stud. And then they asked Brock who he wanted to work with. Brock says, I work with Show. They're like, what? You want to work with Show? I was like, yeah, I work with Show. And then Brock and I had the stretcher match and the matches that we had. And because of that brand split, um, there was the necessity to create opponents for a superstar like Brock that I got an opportunity that my career completely got changed around and took off in a more positive direction. Because when I came up from WCW, everybody hated me in WWE. They just flat out hated me. And it wasn't a conducive learning environment when I came up. They're like, now we have NXT and we have veterans that will talk to you ringside. They will hold your hand and we'll help you. And, oh, you should do this. You should do that. When I came up, it was like, they, if somebody told you something, you didn't want to do it because they were telling you something to screw up on purpose to see you fail. It was a different. It was a shark tank back then. Now it's more brand positive and it's more conducive to building better talent. And a lot of the guys we have now there aren't concerned with themselves so much as building the product and building the future. You want to leave the business better than when you came in. Uh, you talked about your, your, your start in WWF as it yeah. was back then. But tell me back to the, the early days, if you don't <laughs> mind. In, in a previous interview, you told me that by the time you were 12, you were six foot two, I believe. Six two, 220, yeah. Now I'm six two. A damn good looking kid. Of course. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, I'm six two, so I can appreciate no, that. Not. Is very tall. Six, six two and a half. Stop actually. lying. Stop lying. Right. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm five four. He's five four. Um, no. This is me stood up. Yes, that's it. Uh, He's standing on a box, actually. So, were you were you a big fan growing up? Wrestling fan? Industry, oh my yeah. god, dude! My favorite when I was a kid was uh, the Four Horsemen and Ric Flair. Okay. I used to talk trash playing basketball like Ric Flair. I would dunk and woo and strut. <laughs> I would dunk and woo and I would strut the half court and get a technical and I would pin guys in a low post and tell them in order to be the man you got to beat the man and <laughs> you know I would do the hair thing and jet plane flying limousine riding um, I would do dusty impersonations I love dusty dusty Rhodes and Tommy Rich are my two favorite baby faces and I love the four horsemen and Rick Rude are my favorite heels Rick Rude was just even though it was a WWF thing, Rick Rude was the one guy that I always went to in the magazines and stuff, the old pro wrestling magazines, because yeah. I always thought Rick Rude was like, like, dude, look how shredded he is, you know? He's what a real man supposed yeah, to look like. Yeah, he's like hairy and shredded, and <laughs> he's got that chick's face on his butt. Like, that's, <laughs> wow, you know? Like, he's, he's Living the dream. arrogant, yeah, you know? But, you know, and I remember the first time I met, um, I met Ric Flair was in Chicago. And Jimmy Hart had brought me backstage in WCW to meet some every, some of the guys, and uh, I met Arn, which was really cool. And and uh, staying in that, and then I met Ric Flair. Ric Flair, nice to meet you, sir. You know, and I was like, I had to go outside. My buddy's like, you are. I said, dude, I just met Ric Flair. I think I'm gonna faint. <laughs> and I remember leaning. There's a uh, the second story by the locker rooms, and there's a ramp that goes under the bottom, and there's a concrete barrier, and that's like our area back then. I remember leaning on that railing trying to get my breath because I was legitly lightheaded from meeting Ric Flair. And, That's crazy. Because uh, wasn't Flair the first person you beat for the title? Uh, yeah, well, there was the whole mummy incident with Hogan where I kind of won it and didn't win it and stole it and nobody put me over, but I ended up with it. But my, 
Imagine that. <laughs> and then, uh, but my first legitimate um, win was with Ric Flair, and Ric Flair put me over right out of the figure four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right in the chokes. Been... I used to love working with Ric. He used to, he was so amazing. I remember coming down the escalator some town somewhere my first my first weekend road trips, and there's Ric Flair. He goes, what kind of car did you get, Tadpole? And I was Tadpole because I'm green and young. I said, I've got a Cadillac, sir. I'm with you, Big Daddy. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm driving Ric Flair. Oh, my gosh, like. I wrestled Ric Flair that night. You know, oh, wow. it was just I just did everything he told me. It was I was still in fantasy land. You know, uh, he would you give him a press slam off the top, and Hunter and I always laugh. You press Rick off the top rope, he'd grab your hand and move it all around his chest, and then put it right back where you put it before you press slam him off. <laughs> but if you had long hair, he'd pull the hair out of your head when he went over for the press slam. Like, no, Rick, we don't have to do the press slam really, because I'm tired of getting my hair pulled out. <laughs> Yeah, but there was Rick. I mean, I had uh, one of my most brutal matches, I think, in ECW was with Rick. We had a thumbtack match in ECW. Yeah, Yeah, and that was like, I was begging Rick, please. I I was in tears because Rick wanted me to body slam him in the thumbtacks and clothesline him in the thumbtacks. And I'm literally crying backstage like, Rick, please don't make me do that. I don't, just bump me. I don't want to, I did not want to bump Rick into the thumbtacks. It was the worst freaking thing, I think, I've ever had to do a mic here. Other than when I had to dance as Baby New Year, that's the second worst. <laughs> that was just weird on so many levels. But that, that thumbtack match with Rick was one of those matches I just did not want any part of. I didn't want to do it. And that was, Rick was for it. That's what they wanted creative-wise. They wanted this thumbtack match. But I just, I remember, um, there's, what's, the, what's the song, uh, uh, The Day the Music Died? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what it kind of felt like in my heart. Uh, that day doing that to Rick because there's a guy that's your you know you grew up watching you idolize you know he's been a great mentor you know and then you're throwing your hero in thumbtacks and crap I mean you know, there's a lot of other guys I'd have much rather done that too <laughs> so so you are a legit fan growing up as legit you say, legit with, with Ric Flair and with with your stature with your heights did you kind of think pro wrestling would be a good fit I like didn't from know, a young no. age did you think that's how you no, were no I was a Basketball player, um, football. I did. I did everything. I was a good. I was the athlete of the year in 1989 in South Carolina. But um, I was a fan of wrestling. But to be honest, I never, I never had any delusions that I would ever be any good at it. I'm sure some of you would agree. I'm still not any good at it. But anyway, um, I went through a lot of trouble. I lost my father, my grandfather, my coach got fired. Uh, a lot of things happened to me at a very young age that were very impactful. That made. Uh, my career choices change. And when I was looking at what I wanted to do, there was a couple of football teams I thought about trying to walk on to to try out for. Um, And then just talking one night with a friend of mine, I was like, you know, I've always been a wrestling fan. I don't know if I'd be any good at it, but here's my exact quote was, I don't know if I'd ever be a star, but I bet I could get beat up and make enough money that I wouldn't have to get a real job. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, because it just may happen. No, no, I got lucky. I mean, I really did. I had athletic ability. I had a different look. It was a different time. And it was a very hard business to get into back then, because it wasn't like you had, you know, performance centers to go to. There, you know, there were seven or eight different wrestling schools all over, but, you know, there was nobody was hiring back then unless you were an experienced hand that had a – a reputation from working in the indies. You know, I mean, you just didn't get hired by the big companies. It just didn't happen. And uh, I had looked into going to Europe and wrestling for Otto in Europe and his Europe tour, um, working with him over in Germany maybe. I talked to Brad Riggins trying to get trained. Um, a lot of different places. But when it, it worked out for me, Hogan needed an opponent. And uh, it worked out for me to get trained by Terry Taylor and Triple H, who always hates it when I mention that he trained me, so every chance I can, I always bring up the fact that uh, I was trained by Terry Taylor and Triple H. <laughs> so to Hunter's like, dude, stop telling that, man. It, it buries me when people know I train you. Like, he taught you your three moves. Yeah, that's right. One of them he did, the choke slam. Yeah, it is. Um, now, this seems like such a basic question, but I'm really interested to know. You, you've had such an incredible run in the business for the last 20 years. Thanks. When was I would la- consider it a brisk walk. But. Okay. <laughs> yeah, all right. That's, that's more like it. When was the last time you remember getting nervous before a match? Um, Does that ever still happen to you? It happens almost every night. Really? I think the time you lose your passion and intensity walking down the ramp, it's time to give it up. I, I don't get nervous as far as um, 
oh my god, I hope I don't screw up, or there's there's none of that. I get um, excited for the competition. I get excited for walking down that ramp. The 15 or 20 minutes that I'm in the ring, or five minutes, depending on whatever time I get, um, you're never more alive when you walk down that ramp. Whether you guys hate me or like me, or I'm a good guy or bad guy, or confused at the moment and don't know what I am. <laughs> Either way, when I'm out there in the ring, there's a, and especially if I'm fortunate to be in the ring with somebody I enjoy working with, um, there's a perfect synergy. When you've been doing this a long time, you know, uh, people mad at you, kids mad at you, wife's mad at you, bills, whatever it is in your life that we all have that come after us and bother us. For me, when I'm in that ring for that moment, everything else is quiet. It's just me in that ring, my opponent, you know, and it's, uh, it's good to find something in life, and it's very fortunate when you can find something in life that gives you that kind of peace. So even when I'm snarling and drooling and spits flying and I'm pouring sweat. Believe me, I'm at peace on the inside when that's going on. <laughs> um, please retire. Okay. D no, I'm not telling Don't you piss to. Off. I'm not telling you to. <laughs> Does like personally, do, do those chants ever bother? No, you? I was a heel at the time. Um, I think it was very appropriate, and I think honestly, um, and I may be delusional in this, and I'm sure some smart out there will say, "Yeah, you're delusional. You need to retire. You're terrible." <laughs> But I think at the time, I don't think anybody was really happy with what storyline I was doing. Right. right. The storylines that I was doing were like, like they were, it wasn't chant, please retire. I didn't take it as please retire, your work sucks. I took it as, please don't let them keep doing this to you anymore. Please retire. We don't want to see you going through this. Um, maybe. Um, you try to find the positive and everything. There's always going to be people that are going to crap on you no matter what you do. I, uh. I start my day off every morning with blocking people on Twitter. That's how I start my day. I block negativity. So any dumb, random, hateful, moody comment, I get it blocks. I'm great. I'm happy with it. I eliminated negativity. That was a joke. You can laugh unless I block some of you. <laughs> if I've already blocked some of you, then it's a bit awkward. You block then you know what you've done. Room. No, but uh, you, um, you can't let that stuff affect you. Yeah. I mean, sure. It's not, it's not who I am as a person. Uh, Big Show is not Paul White. Paul White is not Big Show. Big Show has some elements of Paul White, like, you know, my temper as the Big Show is Paul White when I get pissed on a little bit uh, bigger scale. You know, I've got a look and a head shake in my eye. You know, I mean, yeah, when I get mad, it's scary. You know, when I'm the Big Show and get mad, it's scary. Um, but that's not who I am. So I can't take, whether it's adoration or negativity, you can't let either one go to your head. If you run around and people tell you they love you all the time, where do you keep grounded? Where do you keep the concept to check yourself on your own morality, on your own ethics, on what you're doing in life? If you walk around everybody blowing smoke up your ass, you really don't have a positive, correct outlook on what you need to be doing. So I take praise um, about the same as I take negativity. I appreciate people that are thankful for the work that I've done. If they like something, I'm appreciative because it's always nice to tell somebody you appreciate something they've done. It's passing positive uh, energy forward. You know what I mean? If somebody, you know, like if I meet somebody and they're really polite, and I say, hey, man, you know what? You're very cool. Thanks for asking that way or, or you know, whatever it is, you always want to keep things positive. There's enough mean people. There's enough negativity in the world. Not that I'm trying to save the world because I'm not, but I'm just saying in, in your own way, I try to manage my life with balance. You know, there are some things when I get negative things, I can agree with them. Like, oh, yeah, that was absolutely terrible. You're 100% right. You know what I mean? Because, you know, hey, things don't go the way you want to sometimes. You have to accept your, your faults and you have to accept your accomplishments and roll on. But the main thing is not to let anything too good or too bad develop how you're going to feel about you. You have to look yourself in the mirror and you have to judge what decisions you've made, whether they're good decisions or bad decisions, you have to judge those on your own. And if you a person that is heavily influenced by what other people say, uh, you're gonna lose your ability to know who you are because your opinion of yourself is gonna re just be on what somebody says to you that day. I, I've dealt with that my whole life since a little kid. I mean, I was 6'2", 220 at 12. I had parents calling me mongoloid and wouldn't let their kids play with me because I was some big freak and I understand. Okay, yeah, uh, 
I was a big, freaky, weird kid. I mean, I'm shaving at 12 years old. I got hair on my chest. He's 12. He looks like he's 18. Keep him away from my kid. I got it. But I had to learn as a kid of who I was as a kid and who I was as a person. Um, I wasn't a big dummy. I was a smart kid that read a lot. I was a nerd that played chess. I mean, um, there were a lot of things I did that didn't fit the norm, but I couldn't let outside people's negativity influence who I was as a person. Uh, I think that's to transfer over as a superstar too, because I think a lot of guys make mistakes in this business when they do do things well in this business, they start believing their own press. Well, I'm the greatest there is. I'm the best there is. I don't have to do this. No. Nobody is irreplaceable in this business. And that's one thing that everybody should know, whether you're Big Show, whether you're John Cena, or whoever you are, there's always somebody else that can step in and fill those shoes. So you should always approach this business with, with grace and humility and with passion and with work ethic. That was a long speech. Sorry. And you did turn it into a therapy session. Like I did. Said, it so got therapy real quick. There you go. Therapy Monday or Tuesday. What's today? Tuesday? Ah, Tuesday. 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 Therapy Tuesday. There you go. <laughs> this is not Diet Coke. Yeah, it is. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> now let's talk about your, your runs, your titles. The, oh, God. I can't remember. Well, so you've, I've written this down. I'm, seven uh, times you. World Heavyweight Champion. The only person to have held the ECW, WWE, and World Heavyweight Championships and the WCW Championship. Um, is there a particular run or feud or, or match that you really fondly recall? What have, you, what have been your favorite times in the business? <sighs> and let's open this up to the floor. If you guys have got any favorite matches or moments from Big Show, let's talk about them and get some Oh stories. yeah, that'll bury me. No, we don't like anything he's ever done. No, don't ask, <laughs> don't ask, he's a nice guy. We don't want to hurt his feelings. Um, I think about a lot of the guys that I've had fun and learned from in the ring. Yeah. I had some great runs with Eddie Guerrero. It was a lot of fun. Uh, great tag team runs with Jericho and Kane. Uh, some rough times as Undertaker's tag team partner. <laughs> <laughs> Real rough times. A lot of a lot of uh, a lot of ass chewings every night from Undertaker on what I did wrong and how I should take three weeks off and quit the business. I think he told me every night, he says, you know what you should do? What's that? You should take three weeks off and quit the business. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You know, the, all those guys pushed me to, to be better. Um, you had a nice run with um, Booker T in 2002. Booker T, yeah. yeah. Big you, Teasy. Yeah, when he was coming uh, up. You had uh, a great match with Vengeance, I believe. Uh, it, was it Vengeance? You, you can't have a bad match with Booker T. Yeah, true. Booker yeah, true. T could have fun in a prison camp. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, I did. You guys have no idea. You guys have no idea what an incredible personality Booker T is. He's worked hard. Uh, he's gone through tremendous adversity. Um, he is definitely uh, from from Sergeant Bro to his original days to all the things he's transcended between. Uh, um, tragedies of impact to his life to crossing over racial barriers um, all the things that Booker has done and then to be in the ring with him who is a relaxed uh, cool ass mofo to work with in the ring <laughs> uh, who's always got a smile and whose uh, uh, intensity level for having good competition is, is right up there uh, Booker was a lot of fun to work with and he's one of the guys that I see whenever I come around, because I call him part-time, right. which I guess I'm part-time now, but <laughs> back when I was working all the time, I call him, oh, part-time, you show up once a month. He goes, hey, man, if you can get the gig. So, but uh, part-time part is uh, part time is one of my favorite dudes, without a doubt. Good man. And what about anyone else? Anyone uh, care to share one of their favorite big show moments Please or matches? Don't. You, you don't, don't. Oh, Mayweather, yeah. So Mayweather was amazing. And well, personally, yeah. my favorite moment. Yeah, good, because I got Build my nose up. broke. Thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, that was my favorite part. No yeah, way, yeah. blood everywhere. Not one of the 200 times I've wrestled Kane. <laughs> I mean, I like those matches. Yeah, yeah, I know. But, I mean, the story they told, the way they presented it, the video packages going in, the attraction yeah. that was at WrestleMania 24, that must have been a special time for you, right? It was a lot of hard work, too, because we were up and down all over the country going to WrestleMania, like media outlets, media outlets, media outlets. And I was spending 10, 12 hours a day with Mayweather doing all this media stuff all the time. 
And uh, I think he got a good understanding of our business, too, because I would talk smack. I used to tell him, I said, yeah, I float like a battleship and sting like a nuke. You know what I mean? Because he was, like, talking about, you know, Muhammad Ali's float like a butterfly and sting like a yeah. bee. So uh, we had a lot of fun talking trash. But, uh, you know, he, like I said before, he was great at, uh, at understanding promotion and stirring emotions in people. And that's, that's all we can do in this business. Like any great movie you go to, any great play you go to, why do you enjoy the movies? Why did you enjoy the play? Because emotionally, it got you involved somehow. And in our business, that's what we try to do. Sometimes we do very well, sometimes we don't. Uh, but that's what we try to do with, with the storylines and the talent we have and the matches is to try to, uh, just for a tiny second, um, let you guys have that emotional outlet. Is Absolutely. there truth to the rumor that you let Mayweather, it was your idea to let Mayweather? Yeah, I told him he had to break my nose. I thought yeah. so. And I also told him to run. I said, after you break my nose, run. Because <laughs> I know me, there's a little bit of berserker ancestry in my bloodline somewhere. And I know for about 20 seconds after that happens, I will pull your arm off. So just run when it happens. And I remember I took off after him, and I thought I had him, but it was one of his uh, bodyguard doubles. <laughs> and then I realized it wasn't him. And then Shane was there, and Shane's always been one of my dearest, dearest friends and, and tormentors um, on the draft night. He goes, where did he go? I couldn't believe he brought that up yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, son of a gun. Yeah, I it, but I remember coming around the corner and I, the blood was coming down my throat and my adrenaline was spiked. And Shane comes out and goes, are you okay? And I went, yeah. And he goes, it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you not get excited when, you know, something like that happens? But, yeah, Mayweather was in the parking lot. They had to go get him out of the car to bring him back because he booked straight to the parking lot. Like, screw this. I'm not being around. I'm out of here. You know, he was all like, I'm like, yeah, I'm good, man. But that, again, to, to the young guy over there's point earlier, blurring the lines between fiction and reality. Sure. You told him to break your, break your nose. Yeah, but when well, it happened, you went after him legit. Well, yeah, because no, that's the thing. I mean, you know, you can, you know, they say, oh, it's a work, it's a work, it's a work. You're still a human being. You still have emotions. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, if <laughs> if somebody tags me in the face in the ring, odds are I'm going to tag them back pretty hard, you know. Um, somebody kicks me in the knee in the ring kind of hard, odds are within a few seconds they're going to get a receipt. So... <laughs> That happens. I mean, just like I've pepper guys and gotten receipts too back in the day. So, uh, you know, it's an emotional business. I mean, sure. Do you do you want to keep it responsible and, and keep the general theme of the angle going? Absolutely. Because if it breaks down, it just looks like you know, two you know dumbasses fighting in the backyard. That's not what you guys paid money for. You guys are paid for for you know s suspense of belief and athleticism. And, you know, storylines with emotional outcomes that either good or bad, something you can relate to, you know, um, just to tune in to see a crack, car crash derby of two guys, you know, um, disrespecting storylines of fight in the middle of the ring. That's garbage. And it's unprofessional. I mean, sometimes it gets heated, but heated is OK. I like intensity. I like heated. You know, I like Chris Jericho. Sometimes we'll yell at a referee when they screw up a count one time. I thought he was going to kill a referee. We had to. A couple years ago, we had some kind of a count out time limit deal, and I think Jericho and I were working against each other, and uh, one of the referees at the time had blown the count, because he was doing this, one, two, however he was doing it, he was doing the count so wrong that it messed Chris up, and Chris was supposed to go to the last one in this tournament, and, and the referee blew the count, screwed it up. And I really thought Jericho was going to yeah. kill him backstage. I mean, Jericho's hot. He's purple. I'm like, hey, man. He goes, no, no, F that. He, I'm like, hey, man, just be cool. Like, be cool. Hey, you guys want to go get somebody to help Chris over here? Because <laughs> I don't want him choking me out. So, but you know what? You got to respect that passion. Um, if you're not passionate and angry uh, when things go wrong, then you don't care enough. I'm not saying you need to be angry all the time, but you shouldn't walk back through the curtain with something screwed up and be like, oh, well, I guess we'll get it tomorrow. No, you need to be pissed. You need to be up at night. I've done things in the ring that I've absolutely hated that Vince has had to like tell me. He'll text me at 5 in the morning and go, you still up? I'm like, yeah. He says, stop thinking about it. Go to bed. I'm like, okay, I'm still up because <laughs> I'm passionate because I care. You know what I mean? And, and sometimes I don't get to do the things that I feel is right, but that's okay. 
I'm doing my job the way I'm supposed to. But, you know, sometimes executing certain things or um, you kind of wish this would have went a little bit better or maybe should have been, this should have been done here. Yeah, I can, I will pick myself to death on that. I, I have to let that stuff go all the time because you want to give the best performance you can for you guys. And a lot of times, 99% of the stuff I'm doing, I'm doing on the fly out there anyway now because I can't sit there and plan a match out from A to Z anyway because I can't remember. So it's more of a like, okay, you do yours, I'll do mine, we'll make it work. But you want me to remember a whole bunch of stuff? Nah, it's not happening, kid. <laughs> no. <clears throat> what are we going to do? Uh, just listen. We'll be fine. You know, I like working guys like Kane and Cena, even Seth or Roman or Randy. I don't have to talk to them at all. You know, I'm not going to sit down. Okay, you're going to move here five feet, and then we'll do that. No, I don't have to say anything. It's like, what's up? See you out there. And then that's when you have, you know, you have better matches because we're feeling what you guys are feeling. Every crowd's different. You're going to react to things differently in London than you'll react in in uh, Dublin, believe it or not. You know what I mean? It, it's it's all different. Uh, so WWE are putting on a big one-off live event of the O2. Right. Next door, tomorrow right. night, as we right. record this. What are the differences you find between the UK crowds and the US crowds? <laughs> which, which is a lot better, right? <laughs> oh, you guys are smart asses. <laughs> <laughs> Do you enjoy uh, no, coming over there? Do you enjoy no, here's the thing. I love, I love performing in front of the English crowds on live events because um, you guys have a good time. The TV sometimes. Different story. Oh, my God. The last thing I want to do is ever talk at a TV in the UK. <laughs> I, no way I want to touch a mic. You fat wanker. <laughs> <laughs> Ha ha, ha 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 ha. Just let me get this out so I can go back, okay? The more you do this, the more I gotta stand out. You fat bastard. So, um, it's a term of endearment. I know it is, I know it yeah, is, but you know, it's funny because um, the, the crowds are passionate and they're having fun, and that's always a good time. I remember uh, a couple, right before the uh, WrestleMania, we we're doing the Andre Battle Royal thing, we're in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is a town that notoriously hates baby faces. I mean, if you're a baby face in Philadelphia, nah, they're not happening. <laughs> they're, they're, nah, not happening. So I remember Vince wanted me to go out and get a promo for the Andre Battle Royal. And I was like, oh, it's Phil please don't make me do that here. <laughs> they're, they're, they'll, they'll eat me alive. That's, they'd, it'll, it'll be, please retire as soon as I pick up the microphone. And he goes, I don't think so. I think them, they're behind you. I'm like, no, they're not. They're, this is Philly. They're, they're gonna hate me. I said, just have like, have like, um, have like the uh, so, social outcast go out there and talk smack, and the, then I'll go out and beat them up, and then you know I'll run them off. No, I, I want to hear from you. I'm like, oh god. So in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, if they say this, I'm gonna say this, and if they say that, ooh, I'm gonna go right there. I'm gonna kick them right where it hurts. So in the back of my mind, I'm literally preparing for a fight to go cut a promo. Not that I'm the greatest promo cutter in the world, I got it. But anyway, so I'm out there and like the crowd was cool. And like the promo went well. In the back of my mind, I'm, keep, I'm waiting for the hand grenade to go off and it's like, okay, now my promo sucks because they're not firing on me. <laughs> and I, this is not what I expected. But you know, so you never know the crowds. I mean, you know, if, it's, if it's something worthy, they're gonna have fun with it. If it's something terrible, they're gonna let you know. And, if they're in the mood to give you a hard time because they've known you for 20 years, then they're going to give you a hard time. So I'm okay with it. I, I think younger in my career, I would have got upset. I think now I laugh. If I hear you fat wanker, I, I chuckle. You know, especially now because I'm not as fat as I used to be. So Let's talk about this. How much, how much timber have you dropped? 50. 50, 50 pounds. pounds. Yeah. That's impressive. In, in what time period? Uh, about three and a half months. Awesome. Yeah, maybe four months. So is this the, the lightest you've been since Mayweather? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually very good. Yeah, I was uh, four, 420, 421 with Mayweather, and I'm um, 417, 418 now, which I hope to be, um, by WrestleMania, I want to be under 400. I mean, the last little bit's always the hardest to go. You'll be in the if, cruiserweight division by then. Nah. <laughs> 205. Well, you no, it, it's, it's funny, because you know, there's a lot of stuff I want to do. There's a lot of parts I want to read for movie-wise and stuff. And, you know, being 500-pound Big Show is cool for being, you know, a sports entertainer. But um, for some of the, the more athletic roles that I'm trying to go for and stuff that I'm trying to pursue, um, 
I'm going to look big on camera anyway. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm not. It's not like I'm working with guys six six and six eight all day long. I'm working with guys that are like five nine, five ten. So, the more uh, the more weight I lose, the healthier it is for my joints and, and knees and better quality of life and uh, and stuff like that. And plus, I'm actually having fun doing this. I mean, you know, it's like uh, for the first time in my career, I'm not really uh, banged up, bruised up, beat up. Um, so this is a good time for me to, to get all this squared away. And, you know, they say diet. The first three letters in the word diet is die. <laughs> so, you know, to really get a hold of something like this, you have to make a lifestyle change. So no more deep fried midgets for breakfast. Um, no. <laughs> Sorry, that was totally bad. I'm going I'm to get, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a letter from somebody saying, we're offended that you deep fry us. I'm like, no, it's a joke. I'm kidding. I'm, I'll, I'll have Dylan vouch for me. Dylan, <laughs> Dylan Postal, uh, Hornswoggle. Well, yeah. Vouch for me. Although I haven't um, seen him in a while. So. <laughs> he's doing all right, though. He's doing his own little thing. He's doing good. He's, you know, the main his thing is... His little thing. <laughs> you just made that really awkward. <laughs> what Sorry. I'm saying Sorry. is, is he's promoting his little wrestling shows. Right, okay. Right. okay. okay. Smaller. Better, yeah. He's promoting his own shows. Much better. There you go. There you go. Great. So, awesome. so listen, I'm gonna, you're... I'm gonna have nightmares. I'm gonna get chased down the street with like 500 of them with sticks or something. Yeah. Get all him. Deep, all deep fried. Yeah. Um, so you are Cajun you're spices. Fun. You're having fun again, which is great. yeah. Uh, dude, you gotta have fun, man. You Life's too short fun. not to. Uh, I personally think there's a real buzz around WWE at the moment. You got things like the Cruiserweight Classic, lots of new right. cool stuff on the network. Loads of indie talents coming in from the UK, US, Japan. That's awesome. Other promotions being talked about on air on WWE programming, yeah. which is sort of a first. A lot of changes afoot. Out of all the new young guys you're seeing coming into the, the, the business, into WWE, is there anyone who you'd like to, to share that dance floor with? Are there any dream matches left for, for Big Show? Oh... Oh, did you just hear my shoulder crack? Yeah, it was amazing. Oh, that was pretty good. Huh? Yeah, it was good. Yeah. <laughs> good for about three of those a day. Um, at what point? Um, I'd like to work with all of them, but how beneficial would it be for me or for them? You know, that's okay. just me. That's just me being greedy and saying, "Oh yeah, I want to work with Kevin Owens, and I want to work with Sami Zayn, and I want to work with Big Cass, and I want to work with Corbin." And, Okay, you've kind of had your time, buddy. You've been doing this 20 years. Like, let these guys do their thing. Um, you and Big Cass, though. I hadn't even thought about that. No, Cass would be fun to work with. I mean, he's got kind of a lot of uh, uh, young, healthy Kevin Nash traits. Yeah. The big boot and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, uh, Cass is going to do well on his own. Uh, Corbin's actually another one I like. Corbin, I like his footwork. Um, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for these guys to fight amongst themselves. I mean... Uh, you got Cass and Corbin and Braun Strowman and uh, Eric Rowan. I'm telling you, I'm really high right now on Eric Rowan. I mean, after working with him this summer, Kane and I tied against him and Braun, trying to help Braun get along really good. But uh, Eric just really impressed. I know Luke Harper is so pissed right now that I'm saying this. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, Eric Rowan has really – I hope my I hope they give Eric a chance to, to compete against uh, – some of the smaller baby faces up because he's going to be a great big guy heel opponent for them. His cardio is good. His psychology is good. His uh, in-ring execution and timing has is, is gotten a lot better. And he's one of my favorite um, big man turnaround guys because, you know, a couple of years ago, Eric kind of got thrown in the mix. They needed a guy for the Wyatts. So, yeah, Luke Harper was really good. We know how good Luke is. Luke could have a match with a broomstick. He's amazing. You know, Bray's good. So, you know, Eric had a lot of catching up to do. But in that time, I think he has, and I think, you know, he superseded a lot of our, you know, locker room expectations because, I mean, he's such a great guy. But then to see uh, in the ring now his timing, it's just a different feel out there with him now. It's like, it's like, holy crap, man, he's really getting it. He's, like, good. So now how do you translate that from that character with the green overalls, it looks like the seagull crap on his back, whatever he put on his back there. I always tell him, I always say, dude, it looks like a giant seagull crap on your back. Like, what is that, you know? But, uh, you know, uh, if they give him a chance to uh, to just get in the ring, compete, and they give him some match time, I mean, you know, I'm telling you, Eric could have some good matches with, with uh, as a good heel opponent for anybody. I mean, you know, if you had Seth Rollins as a babyface, this is hypothetically dream booking. 
Because when Seth Rollins turns baby face, he's going to light this place on fire, in my opinion. Um, but you have Seth Rollins, you have somebody like Eric Rowan, who if you give him some time and build him, he can have incredible matches with Seth Rollins. He can have incredible matches with Kevin, with with Sammy. Um, I'd love to see Eric have a nice little uh, nice little run beating the crap out of Neville, too. You know what I mean? Because yeah. that would be a good little heel um Big Show, Rey Mysterio kind of thing, but in a different different light, you know. But Eric would be a good opponent for him. You know, the only question is, is when you're trying to build two guys, who wins? Mm. You know what I mean? I think that's the problem we run into a lot now with our creativity is because they're trying to build guys, but, you know, they don't want to beat anybody. And then when anybody gets beat, everybody, oh, what did they beat him for? They're dropping him out. They're dropping him out. Nobody's getting jobbed out. It's entertainment. Relax. Trust me, I know. I've been jobbed out a lot. <laughs> Well, Still pays talking. well. Still here. Uh, so talking about the Wyatt family, there's, yes. another, there's another big man who's uh, making waves at the moment. He's destroying all the uh, enhancement talents every week Wrong. on Raw, yeah. which people are loving. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need that guy. You that, need, but you are need... you going to be the guy to come and stop him? No, I think I don't think they'd want me to do that. I think uh, that would be uh, – depends on how it's set up. For me just to come back and be Braun, what does that do for him? What does mm. it do for me? Do I need to beat Braun? There's no emotional connection there. You know what I mean? There's not, it's not like I showed up to say goodbye and he comes out and hits me in the head with a bat, you know, and, you know, takes a leak on my carcass or something. Then we're emotionally invested. Yeah. But there's no reason for me to, to, to go out there and compete against Braun yet. Um, he's got some hurdles he needs to overcome on his own, too. And I, I don't mind him. I don't mind him doing the, the squash matches. I really don't because I think that's one thing that that uh, we should do for a lot of our big guys that we kind of get away from. You, you know, you're used to seeing Kane and I constantly every week in competitive matches. Kane and I shouldn't be in competitive matches. Kane and I are attractions. We're freaks. You know, Kane and I should come in. You hear our music. You feel bad for who we're wrestling. They get destroyed in three minutes. We leave. You know, you don't want to see Kane and Big Show every week competitive, competitive, because it takes a lot of the mystery away. Mm. So what they're doing with Braun, I think, is a good thing. If Braun's your next Big Show monster giant thing, cool, build him. You know what I mean? And let him discover who he is. You know, if he gets better, then that's good. Then you've got something you invested time in. And, uh, you know, we'll see. Just, you, you know, he's going to need opponents. Brock's going to need opponents. You know mm. what I mean? It's tough. I mean, they've already had that little run in a little bit, but yeah. you know, I mean, you got somebody that's a draw like Brock. You got to build guys for him, so you got to protect the guys. To you know, it's the way business used to be done a long time ago. You used to build guys for Hogan. You used to, you know, what I mean. That was you had one guy in your territory that was your draw, and you built opponents for him. That's how the business works. Not everybody gets to get over. Not everybody gets to win matches. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Cody Rhodes told me once that the. Uh, <laughs> Love Cody. He's amazing. Yeah. He, he told me once that the worst opponent he's ever been in the ring with, uh, in the ring with, was Justin Gabriel. Nothing personal. They just they, they couldn't work it out. The chemistry wasn't there. They said we had so many TV matches, but we just never had a decent match. Who has been your worst opponent? Who have you not quite clicked with? Ah, uh, not quite clicked with. Golly. Um. Carly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? No, um, I was saying golly, not Carly. Um, no, golly, no, no, like over no, no. pop. No, no. no, actually, Carly and I did fine because I knew I knew Carly didn't have much mobility, um, so I knew that I just I hit the ropes. I, I sold for him. Yeah. yeah, I did the selling. So I, I mean, it was a little tough getting my head back and getting chopped in the chest with my move, but hey, whatever, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think. Uh, some of the guys that I've had problems with that I couldn't wrestle with, I, I don't, I never really had to work with them again. Uh, there were some guys that I've worked with that I'm not going to sit here and, and bury people and throw mud and stuff like that. But um, there were certain guys that didn't want to um, understand what we're trying to do. Um, the biggest stars we've ever had in this business um, got me for who I am. Stone Cold, Stone Cold Soul. Rock soul. Rock used to get me on one knee and spread his feet out so we were the same height when he was fighting me because he loved that visual of me being down on one knee and him standing up trying to fight me and we're the same height. Mm. You know, when you when you take your ego out of it, 
Um, Brock Lesnar loves working with me because when I chunk Brock around, it gives Brock a chance to sell. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, Brock's business oriented, but he understands how much you need an opponent. Uh, John Cena, three offensive moves, I flatten John Cena. You know, and John Cena sells. We all know the finish. Hey, hey, see you, bye. But that's what people pay for. It's always a spectacle to see John pick me up. Um, there were some guys in the past that just uh, um, didn't want to do it that way. They thought they were uh, stronger, bigger, better, whatever you know, the time was. I'm just not going to waste my time. I'll try to help somebody and try to work with them. And, you know, if it's – I'm nobody's – anybody's, you know, punching bag, get over bag, whatever you want to call it. I'm here to help anybody. I'll take crazy bumps. You guys know that. I'll take press slams off the top. I'll do whatever I have to do to get somebody over. But if I don't feel the um, it's reciprocal, then I'm out. I just won't work with them. I don't, have, I don't have to deal with it. I've already I've eaten enough mud and dirt and blood in the, in the trenches. I don't have to deal with somebody's ego. So uh, I think the worst match with one of my closest friends that I absolutely loved that was actually horrible was Randy and I. And Randy and I are really good friends, and I have freaked up every freaking time we've wrestled. Him. <laughs> and I always say, right, if you have a bad match with Randy Orton, you're terrible. Well, I've had a couple bad matches <laughs> with Randy, so I guess that says a lot. My favorite was the Phantom RKO. <laughs> That's my favorite one because, you know, I'm always about my gut and my instinct. And, and listening to you guys out there, sometimes, sometimes the match will stop because it's time to go. Sometimes it's not time to go. Sometimes it's a choke slam and it's not there. Hey, kick out. We'll go to something else. But you always got to listen to you guys. And I remember um, Dean Malenko was our, our producer. And uh, I was going to take the DDT off the top rope uh, that Randy gives, the one where he planes you out and DDTs you. And I said, dude, I'll feed right up. That's the perfect spot. You slide in for the RKO there. Because that's such an impressive move, we can't get him any higher. You know, because you always want to get your fans at the highest, and then you hit the big finish. So Dean wanted me to have Randy go for the RKO, shove him into the ropes, choke slam up behind into the RKO. Okay, that's cool. I get it, but I'm telling you, I know if I hit, the, it's going to be good right here. You know, so that's we agreed to do what Dean said, and I'll be damned if right in the middle of the match. Um, I take the DDT and I'm like, oh, this RKO is going to be so loud. Oh, it's going to be nice. I fed up and went, boop, and fell. I'm looking at Randy's shoe. And I'm like, yeah, that sucked. <laughs> you know, then the crowd's going, you effed up and all. But, you know, what sometimes, you sometimes, you know, uh, simple, stupid works. You know, you can overcomplicate stuff. And that's one thing I try to, to tell our guys, too, is um, um, remember sitting in the crowd. There are times when you have, um, when you have finishes and matches. You say you have a tag team match. It's a new tag team. Uh, real simple. Heels get heat on the baby face. Baby face makes a hot tag. Runs his comeback. Go home. If you put dips in a finish, it doesn't really look like they're dips. If they're not emotionally invested or aware of you, it just looks like you can't get the job done. So when you have a chance to go over when you're green, when you're new, when you're young, make your comeback and go over. Putting dips and finishes are when you guys know who they are, when you guys are emotionally invested in them. But it makes sense because what happens? You see a dip in a Shawn Michaels match, you go, oh. And then when they turn it around and he gets it back, you're like, yay, because we got what we wanted. You know what I mean? If a guy hasn't proven to you that he deserves your emotional effort, you just go, well, okay, that was cool, but yeah. just looks like he didn't get it done. Yeah. I don't know. That's You guys are looking like, oh, what is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, right, we're going to have to wrap this up. I'm being wrapped up, unfortunately. We're running out of time. Uh, just Why, because I'm like long-winded? Yeah, you think? No. Why do you think Vince never gives me a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> now you're learning the hard way. He learned 20 years ago. <laughs> Don't let the windbag talk. Now, I can't finish off this, this show without telling you something that happened last week on the show. Uh, every week we do a feature called Skillet's Random Question. This is Skillet. Hey, big I met Skillet many yeah, times. This yes. is, you met him in an elevator in New York. In New York, in Brooklyn, SummerSlam. He texted me. I, he was very excited. I was, and I said that you were very nice to me, yet pissed off that somebody... The oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We get in the elevator and somebody <laughs> Christmas treat us, and the elevator was so slow. And I'm like, again, I got to pee, and I'm sitting there going, 
Mm. Yeah. Because he's not good every floor. Every floor. <laughs> so it's just him, Skillet and I in the elevator, and it's like really awkward because I'm like fuming. <laughs> and he's like, I'm in here with the big show, but it's just him and I. And he's not. <laughs> So this is awkward. <laughs> so, so I'm going to make that awkwardness even worse. If you don't okay. Mind. So last week on the show, he posed this question to us, uh, Skillet's random question, who is the best big man of all time? And then what he does is he, give, he gives us four different oh, options. Oh, yeah, I, I'm not going to get offended by that at all. Are you not? Thank not at all. So the, the four options he gave us were, were Vader, no. Bam Bam Bigelow, no. Andre the Giant, no. and Bruiser Brody. You, arguably the greatest big man of all time, would not... <laughs> Yeah, on his list. Well, that's fine, but he did. did he, he, only, to he only took. He only picked one real big guy. It's Brody. No, it was Andre. Andre. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, picked no, Vader six five. I know, but you know what I mean. Don't I mean, don't be a mark for a moonsault. Okay, good point. Good point. No, good point. I hear what you're don't saying. Don't be a mark for a moonsault. Who, who would you put in that? Who, who, who would, would I put be, in the, best be the, the Mount Rushmore of big wrestlers? Undertaker. Yeah. Number oh, okay. one. Okay. No, but my point. Six ten, six eleven. Yeah. Greatest big man of all time. Undertaker, okay. not short fat guy. No, listen. <laughs> big man. I agree with you. And I totally agree with you. But my thing was uh, wrestlers that are no longer wrestling. That's what okay, I meant. Well, don't preface your question to sound like you're yeah, smarter. You didn't say you're that like, to us. <laughs> guys are no longer wrestling. Did did, did have green eyes? No, right, no, no. I'm gonna tell you right now. The, the greatest. Out of this. No, the greatest big man of all time are Taker and Kane. Okay. Okay, flat out. Kane can have a match with anybody from Rey Mysterio to me to anybody. Undertaker can have a match with The Big Show, Brock Lesnar, Shawn Michaels. Remember the match he had on Raw with Jeff Hardy? Absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Oh, of course. What Undertaker can work with anyone. When you say greatest big man of all time, I'm not talking about guys that do moonsaults or fancy moves or ooh, got a good win-loss record okay. or, or beat the hell. Guys that can work. Sure. Taker. Kane. Greatest big man of all time. Andre, greatest giant of all time. Absolutely. Andre worked his character. Absolutely. Andre never ducked for anybody. Do you remember when Andre used to suplex guys? He never put their arm over his head. Mm -hmm. He'd hook their head and hook their arm and suplex them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, screw your couch. Definitely. Here we go. <laughs> okay, Andre was his character. Uh, was Bam Bam Bigelow a tremendous athlete? Great worker? Absolutely. Absolutely. But Bam Bam Bigelow is what? 6'5", 300 okay. pounds? All right, okay. See what I'm saying? Fair enough, fair enough. Ray Trailer is one of the best big man workers of all time. If you talk about Big Boss Man big back boss in the day man, when man. he was big, Big Boss Man was amazing. So, I mean, you know, Kevin Nash, when Kevin Nash yeah. was Diesel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kevin Nash was amazing. You know, he had the swagger, the look, but he could work and sell. He was believable getting guys over. You know, that's when I look at greatest of all time, I look at guys that how they work on getting other people over. Okay. Fair so, enough. you know what I mean? I'm not, because he do a moonsault, big deal. <laughs> I've done a moonsault. Yeah, you have. Have you? I have. I'm, I'm thinking about trying to bring it out, though. I in, might do a moonsault. In the Cruiserweight but... Classic? <laughs> um, yeah. I'm so disappointed you didn't choke slam skillet through this big Dude, time. come on, man. I'm, I'm like Gandhi. I'm like, peace. Thank you, big show. Sure. Okay. God, thank yeah. you. So on that peaceful note, thank you so much to all the listeners of GP who have come down uh, to the show today. And thank you once again to the big show. We have round of applause. Thank you, guys. You guys are very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh... I hope you guys had a wonderful experience today. So. Oh, we've even got theme music coming <laughs> out good. of it. Nice. Oh, you're fine. You're good. I hope you guys had a good experience today. So, yeah. you know. Thank you very much, everyone. I just sometimes I get. <laughs> I know you guys are like, holy shit. He's like, confrontating us. No, I was like, I want to challenge you guys on how you look at things, just like I challenge you young guys in our business. Why do you think this way? Why do you think somebody owes you something? Why do you think you deserve a push? What have you done that makes you think you deserve a push? Why? What are you thinking in your head? What have you contributed? What are you going to contribute? You know, don't get, you know, Vince has a philosophy, and I try to tell it to the younger guys, and it's the greatest single philosophy you'll ever learn in life. Treat every day like your first day at work. What do you do the first day on a job? You say hello to everyone. You have a positive attitude. They ask you to do anything, you go out and you do it with a good attitude. You're not jaded, you're not bitter, you're not pissed, you're not getting a push, you're not selling enough merch. You know, whatever dumb shit that gets in guys' heads that ruins their careers. How many great talents have we seen in WWE that we love, that I love working with, that got a case of the toods and attituded themselves right out of the business? You know, can't do it, man. It's not real. Have fun. Yeah.